We have to do this as a unified group. Otherwise, all we end up being is a body meant for the Lord that's sitting in hospice. We need to die. So last week, we, um, we did a pretty fluffy um, message. Um, not a lot of substance on conflict, uh, because I know many of you don't understand uh, the concept of conflict, because we don't deal with that in the church. But if you were here, you understand that's not entirely true. What we're going to be talking about today is kind of a, um, an extension of last week. Because one of the main things that happened last week was this idea of unity. The conflict is the enemy of unity. And so as I was thinking about what, what should come this week, I thought about this idea of the body. Because we are the body of Christ. And my mind immediately went to one of my favorite passages. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the poor youth have to hear about this a lot. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us a beautiful picture of how we're to be as the church. But before we do that, we want a little bit of a backstory as to what's going on here. Why is it that Paul is writing this particular chapter in this particular book? See, the Corinthian church was at odds within itself. Paul... Um, for example, people would say, Paul led me to the Lord. Others would say, well, Apollos led me to the Lord. So you had people just vying for who had more prestige by who led them to the Lord. Then spiritual gifts became a problem. What spiritual gift did you have? What kind of prestige was attached to that spiritual gift? Now, Paul is quite forward with the church, pulling very few punches. And this is one of the things that I really appreciate the apostle, about the Apostle Paul. Uh, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm not definitely not quite where he's at, but I'm more of a Pauline personality than, say, the Apostle John, who is more considered the love apostle. But Paul pulls very few punches, and we see in chapter 3 that he says this, in verse, uh, starting in verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as fleshly, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and now you are still not able to receive it, for you are still carnal. Paul is all up in these people's faces. So in chapter 12, Paul paints a picture of a healthy church body, and it is to this imagery that we turn this morning to see if we can indeed answer the question, are we here at sunrise a healthy body? We move to chapter 12. Paul says this in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Again, pulling no punches as he starts this. He's, he's in their face and he's saying, look, you guys, I, I don't want you to be ignorant. Right? In today's Politically correct society, if you call somebody ignorant, that's a rude thing to say. But Paul's not wanting them to be ignorant. He doesn't want them to be uninformed. And he certainly doesn't want them to be carried away by dumb, stupid idols. He wants them to be focused on the Lord. We continue in verse 3. That therefore I make known to you that no one speaks by the whole by the Spirit of God calls Jesus uh, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now this is where you first see this idea of unity in the church, and what is that unifying key? It's the Holy Spirit. The thing is, is that each and every one of us in here, when you look, I, I don't see anybody who looks anything the same. We come from different places within the country. We come from different places within the world. We come from different parents. We're wearing different clothes, even though some of the clothes may be alike. I don't see anybody here who looks anything alike, except for maybe in your essential form. But when you think about the body of Christ, that which unifies us is the Spirit of God indwelling us. Paul says earlier in this book that we are the temple for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings unity amongst the body of Christ. At least, that's what it should. That's what He should be. And that's what we should allow Him to do. 
But Paul recognizes, as we move on to verse 4, that there are diversity of gifts. That there are differences in ministries. But notice the same Spirit, the same Lord. That there's diversity in activities, but the same God who works all in all. So Paul is saying that we are unified, but he also recognizes that even within our unity, we are still very different. We have different roles. And we're going to see this theme just continue throughout this entire chapter. He continues in verse 7. He says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the what? For the profit of all. See, for much of my life, when I was growing up, I would see the differences. They were, they were good, but they were bad. And what God is saying here, what, through Paul, is he's saying, look, I've created you all very differently. But you can find strength in your differences. In fact, I have given you these differences to strengthen you as a body. And he continues to emphasize this as he moves on into verse 8 and following. He says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the workings of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, discerning of spirits. And to another, different kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. Now, I know I have to pause for a second and say, I know it's very easy for us to get caught up, especially in the Baptist culture, with a couple of those last two. Uh, we're not going to emphasize what spiritual gifts are being done now or not. The point is, is that at this point in time within the church, the gifts of tongues and all of these particular gifts are manifesting themselves. And, and Paul is saying, these are present. And what he's saying is, y'all are losing sight of what they're here for. Because he continues on in verse 11, and he says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. That's very important to note, and it's something that we tend to overlook. This is not about our will. This is not about us. This is about as He wills. This is ultimately about Him accomplishing His will purposes. He continues, for the body is one and has many members. But all the members of that one body, me and many, are one body also in Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free. This is Paul's way of saying, it doesn't matter who you are in any socioeconomic standing, how much money you make, how, how little money you make, whether or not you be a slave, whether you be a free man, whether you be a Jew, a Greek, a Gentile, a German, an Australian, it doesn't matter who you are. We are all one in the body, though we are many parts. And this is very important for us to understand because, again, think about the context of what's going on here. This church is at odds with itself. They're trying to separate themselves out by these gifts that God has given to them for His purposes. For the, for the betterment of the body. And yet, they are using them to differentiate each other and tear each other apart. He continues in verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Ridiculous, right? When you, when you read through this, you think it's absolutely ridiculous. For me, I pause and I, and I think to myself, it's even silly that Paul has to have this conversation with, not children, but with grown adults. But thankfully, he's using imagery that we can understand. Right? This idea of saying, like, well, you know, if my eyes should say, well, you're, 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 not, you're not me, so you're, you're just not part of the body. I mean, it, it, it's ridiculousness. And yet, this 
is where Paul has to go. For he says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the, if the whole were hearing, where would smelling be? Are you starting to pick up on this picture here, what he's talking about? Can you imagine if you were to just take your hand and cut it off and throw it on the floor and say, live? What is it by itself? You can answer. <laughs> Nothing. You might even say, it's dead. But we continue on. Verse 18. But now God has set the members of each one of them in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? And he, he just continues to pound this idea. And, and the imagery gets even more out there. He did his verse 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And that I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Right? I don't need you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I don't have need of you. Now, these pictures are kind of goofy, right? But you, you think you'd start getting a picture of what, what he's saying here. That this, you, the head, meaning the young lady over here, can't say to the foot, I, I don't have need of you. I mean, just think about that. How many of you appreciate your feet? So most of you are okay if we just come and hack them off right now? Let's, again, not much response here. Right? How many of you have ever stepped on something sharp? How many of you have ever broken a toe? How many of you have ever torn a ligament? How many of you have ever sprained an ankle? How many of you have ever had anything bad happen to a foot? It's, as my Spanish brethren say, no bueno. It's... It is not good. It is incredibly uncomfortable. But we're getting, Paul is just continuing to compound this imagery and showing us how, how ridiculous the idea, the thought that we could just so easily cast part of the body away. We move to verse 22. No, much rather those members of the body which seem, somehow I'm on the wrong side. There, there you go. No, much rather, the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Verse 23. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Now, I tried to think in my mind how best to explain this. Now, when you think about your body, right, we, we have this thing, especially as we get older, we have this thing pumping in our chest called the heart. We get really concerned about that. Um, there's probably some of us who have family members who know of people who have Alzheimer's or some form of degenerative brain disorder. And so we, we put special honor upon the heart, brain. Um, to a less extent, we, we put honor on our lungs, although anybody who's ever seen anybody die of lung cancer, you understand how critical they are. But often we don't think of things like this. Now, there's probably some of you who don't know what this is, some of you who do. This is a generated representation of a red blood cell. If you've ever cut yourself, you've seen these, but in mass quantities, floating in plasma. Now, what many of you probably aren't aware of is a little molecule that's stuck to them. This is a computer-generated representation of a hemoglobin molecule. We'll get to hemoglobin here in a second. But those red blood cells are covered with this hemoglobin. And it has a very specific purpose. But so often when we think about our body, as I mentioned earlier, things like this, the brain, or we think of the heart. Now, we get back to this idea of the hemoglobin, however. What is hemoglobin? So for those of you who don't know what hemoglobin is, I'll give you a quick little definition, and then we'll continue on. Hemoglobin is the, in the blood carries oxygen from the respiratory organs, i.e. your lungs to the rest of the body, where it releases oxygen to burn nutrients to provide energy to power the functions of the organism and collects the resultant carbon dioxide to bring it back to the respiratory organs to be dispensed from the body. 
Now, how many of you find breathing to be very important? Okay? Now, how many of you think it's important that the rest of your body gets that oxygen? Now, I would think that would be most of us. Many of you probably never even thought of the fact that this teeny little insignificant molecule is integral to your survival. And yet, if you remove hemoglobin from the body, you will die. Suddenly, this thing that seems to be so small, seems to be so insignificant, sitting on something else that seems to be so small and insignificant, is integral to the survival of this and this. Without those, the whole perishes. We continue on. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the parts which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body. This, this idea of a division and a tearing apart of the whole body has to work integrally together so that it can survive. Can you imagine if, now some of you are going to probably jokingly laugh at this, but can you imagine if even 10% of your body just decided to stop? Now, I know some of you think, yeah, I, I feel that way right now, but I'm going to my body stop. But I mean, seriously, if your nervous system decided to stop, if 10% of your heart decided to stop, you know, I, I remember back to um, my, my glory days of playing on the Sun I softball team. It was about a game and a third before I broke my thumb. You realize what just this one little thing stopped? This one little thing, out of all ten of these, this one right here, I couldn't play guitar anymore. A very small percentage of my whole stopped me from performing a major function. Something of lesser value than, say, my heart stopped me from performing one of my callings for a time. But the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You know, some of you knew last week when I was talking about a gentleman who stepped on a, a, a staple that was Glenn Roach. And amazingly, Glenn makes it into my second sermon because last Saturday, not yesterday, the Saturday before, I didn't know this whole story until I went and saw him on Monday, but Glenn was just sitting. He's just sitting. He hears his wife come home, his daughter come home, and he gets up. And then he ends up on the ground. His leg, from just under his knee to his ankle, shattered. Turns out Glenn has osteoporosis and had no idea. Suddenly, a member that has not a month, that great of honor gave out, and the hole was on the ground. I won't go into all the details, but I'll just say it was a very unpleasant sight. I got to see some pictures. And he's recovering well now. The surgeons were able to repair everything. But it brought to mind this idea of just how important such a simple thing could be. Suddenly, he's not able to walk. He's not able to support the whole. And if he were on his own, he would perish. But thankfully, there are others to come alongside him and encourage him and help him and, and do all those things. But it just brings to, to mind how the whole begins to suffer. I mean, just something so simple as a splinter. <laughs> Have you ever noticed, you get one of those ones that are like almost microscopic. You can't really see them, right? Unless you get the light just right, you can see kind of the glistening of them right there. You're like, seriously, how can something so small cause such pain? Or our wonderful friend, the honeybee. You know, even just one of those, incredibly uncomfortable. 
something so small, something so insignificant, and suddenly the whole begins to suffer. Paul continues. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So here we've been talking about this body and whole and, and members, and we are individuals within this body. So the question begs itself, what does this mean? Well, what it means is that each of us, and each of you, has a role to play in the body of Christ, if indeed you have Christ in your life. So then that begs this question. What happens if enough of the body does not function? It dies. The body dies. Now, have you guys ever heard of the 80-20 rule? The auto has. Okay, I'm going to tell you the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule not only applies to church, it applies to business, it applies to just life in general. It's, it's a rule of thumb, it's not an exact science. Some of you may have heard me talk about uh, it in relation to the youth group. Uh, statistics show, even statistics within the last five to six years, show that 20% of kids continue to walk with the Lord after they graduate from high school, 80% walk away. That's an example of the 80-20 rule. In relation to the church, 20% of the people do 80% of work, 80% of the people do 20% of work. Sometimes that's more, sometimes that's less. Now, think about that in terms of your physical body. Again, what if 80% of your body decided to take a vacation? It would be very difficult for you to function, right? And as we get older, you know, that's part of the progressing towards to dying, right? The body begins to shut down, and once that certain system shuts down, then we die. But each and every one of us understands this principle, if only to that level, of how integral our body is, and how more of it functioning properly helps us live life more fully, more comfortably, more effectively. And obviously we have to adapt as we grow older, but thinking about this in the terms of church, how effective, if our body can't effectively function at 80%, with 80% incapacitated, how effectively can the church do its work with only 20% of the people doing anything and 80% essentially consuming resources? I'm going to make this bold statement the American church has lost sight of what church is about. Simple fact is that we make church about us as individuals, and we seek our needs first before the needs of the body. Beginning of the week, I found a, a blog post by Thomas Rayner. He is a PhD um, from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's the president and CEO of Lifeway. So if you've ever been to Lifeway, he's the guy who heads his company. He uh, was a founding dean of the Billy Graham School of Missions, Evangelism, and Church Growth. His many books include Surprising uh, Insights from the Unchurched, Unexpected Journey, and Breakout Churches. I kind of likened him to kind of a, a statistician. He likes, he likes to get a pulse on society. And he, he wrote this little blog article, and it really resonated with me. Because I haven't been in the ministry more than, well, it's, it's almost been five years, the professional ministry. But before that, I've been in ministry for over 20 years as a lay minister and now as a professional minister. And I've noticed trends from youth groups and other churches, visiting churches, being part of churches, those kinds of things. And this, this really resonated with me. And this is what he says. And, and he's specifically talking about the back door. Um, that is people leaving church and why people leave the church. But the insights that he shares in here are really convicting, I think, and really an indictment on the American church. But he says a number of gifted persons and organizations have studied the phenomenon of the church back door. The metaphorical way we describe people leaving church. And they will always, there will always be the anticipated things of relocation and personal crisis. We should recognize those issues. Though we can respond to the latter more than the former. But all the research studies of which I am aware, including my own, return to one major theme to explain the exodus of church members. And that is 
a sense of some need not being filled. In other words, these members have ideas of what a local congregation should provide for them. And they leave because their provisions have not been met. Certainly we recognize there are legitimate claims by church members of unfulfilled expectations. It can undoubtedly be the fault of the local congregation and its leaders. But many times, probably more than we would like to believe, a church member leaves a local body because he or she has a sense of entitlement. I would therefore suggest that the main reason people leave a church is because they have an entitlement mentality rather than a servant mentality. And he gives a few examples of some quotes that he received from people as to why they left a particular church. Quote, the worship leader refused to listen to me about the songs and music I wanted. Quote, the pastor did not feed me. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Quote, no one from my church visited me. Next one, I was not, I was not about to support the building program they wanted. And again, I was, I was out two weeks and no one called me. Next, they moved the times of the worship services and it messed up my schedule. And my personal favorite, I told my pastor to go visit my cousin and he never did. He continues on, please hear me clearly. Church members should expect some level of ministry and concern. But for a myriad of reasons, Beyond the scope of this one blog post, we have turned church membership into country club membership. You pay your dues, and you are entitled to certain benefits. The biblical basis of church membership is clear in Scripture, he continues. The Apostle Paul even uses the member metaphor to describe what every believer should be like in the local congregation in 1 Corinthians 12, 12-31. Paul describes church membership not by what they should receive in a local church, but by the ministry they should give. Each member has been gifted to perform a function within the body, and without that function being accomplished, the rest of the body suffers. This was really difficult for me as I processed through this, because... We've been conditioned since we were young to expect certain things of leaders, right? A leader is responsible for everyone who's underneath them. Every last thing that goes on underneath them, they're responsible. And, and I experienced that um, when I was a supervisor. I had an employee not follow procedure, ended up destroying a half a million dollars worth of product. That employee lost their job. I almost lost my job. Um, and I was responsible for a situation that I was unaware of until everything had already been accomplished. Now, when you think about it in terms of the body, the brain is in control of a lot of systems. But there are a vast number of subsystems within your body that your brain does not control. Those things have to just happen. Okay? The brain cannot attend to everything that is going on. It's up to these subsystems to care for one another. You think of Moses when his father-in-law Jethro comes and says, Look, you're, you're burning yourself out here, but you need to get people underneath you to help care for others around you. When you think about it in the scope of, of a pastor, it is physically impossible for me to attend to each and every one of your needs. It is physically impossible for me to attend to all of the needs of those that are not here that are part of this extended family. It doesn't mean that I don't care about them. It doesn't mean that I don't care about you. It just means that I'm not physically capable of doing that. One of the best examples in my mind that was given to me when I was going through schooling was that of Jesus himself. In the form of God, the eternal God in heaven, he's able to attend to all our needs. But when he was here, locked himself in physical form, he was able to have close relationship with how many people? Three really close, and then another nine to an extended, and then there was a 70, and so forth, but to a lesser degree. 
So that's what statistics have shown. So, now think about that in the scope of the body of Christ here. That's why it's so important for you guys to have relationships with one another, to build communities, to take advantage of things like life group, so that you can build relationships. Because Troy and I can't physically have a relationship with every single one of you. I mean, just our culture says, I can't really have a very close relationship with the ladies anyway, which takes about 70% of the congregation away anyway, because there's more women here than men, right? But yet we have these expectations, like you heard here, that say this is how church is to be. It's this upside-down pyramid kind of thing where the church has to rest on a pastor as opposed to having it flipped around. Where we care for one another, the body cares for each other. The body actually utilizes its gifts, right? A few weeks ago, was it last week? I can't remember if it was last week or if it was at the um, Samuel business meeting. We talked about the expectations of the pastor. And it was basically that the pastor has to embody all the spiritual gifts and all the gifting and all the wisdom and everything of everybody possible, and that's what it is. And, and he has to do all those things. And, and this was one of my favorite things about being a leader. We are all great, not all of us, but most of us are really great about coming up with great ideas about how the church can grow, how the church can be healthy. And pastor, if you just did this, this is how this would happen. But if the body is not willing to move, if the body is not willing to function, if the body is not willing to lift, if the body is not willing to go out and actually propagate itself, you realize that your skin cells recycle every 30 days? Every 30 days. We have to be growing from within. We have to be going out and growing ourselves, the people around us, bringing people to Christ. That's not just my job, that's the job. We have to do this as a unified group. Otherwise, all we end up being is a body meant for the Lord that's sitting in hospice, waiting to die. Pastor coming along and trying to give a little bit of care, nursing the body along, until finally it just closes up shop. And there are thousands of churches doing that every single year. And to a large degree, I believe it's because the people of the church have a wrong idea about what church is supposed to be. It's not meeting my needs. It's not accomplishing what I think should happen. And I'll go find that place that will at least fulfill my need for a period of time until they go, and then I'll go find somewhere else. It's that American consumer mentality that has infected the church that says it's all about you as an individual. And it's killing the church. So are we healthy here at Sunrise? I'm going to leave that up for you as individuals to decide. I'm going to leave that up for each and every one of you to consider your role here at this church. Are you fulfilling what the Lord is calling you to be in this church? Are you finding yourself to be someone who is actively trying to see the body of Christ become healthy and grow? Or are you content to consume until you get as much as you can get and then you move to the next place? Because that's not what we've been called to. We've not been called to just survive. We've been called to thrive. We've been called to grow. We've been called to propagate ourselves. To see the church grow. You realize there's a billion people on this planet to say that they have faith in Christ. A billion people. And yet there's over six billion people who don't. Can you imagine if a billion people actually started preaching for the Lord, actually started living for the Lord, actually started serving for the Lord? And it doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. I'm, I'm sick and tired of people using young and old as excuse. Every single age group I've ever met has found an excuse as to why they can't serve the Lord. It's ridiculous. The same spirit that lives within me, lives within you, and can empower you to do what you've been called to do in the place you are right now. No matter how physically degenerated you may be, no matter how injured you may be, 
no matter how uneducated you may be. For crying out loud, he took fishermen and built the church. He took sinners, transformed their lives, and built the church. He took cowards and built the church. He can use us. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for this day. And I pray that your spirit would move beyond these words. Lord, that there would be no fear in this congregation. There would be no fear in, in us whatsoever to boldly proclaim your word to this world. To find ourselves spilling out from these walls, sharing the joy that is within us. That we would not be content to just sit around and survive. But that we would desire to thrive. That we would not just be content to allow 6 billion people on this planet to go to hell. But it was a sense of urgency. We would share the word and the hope that is within us. Father God, you are worthy of all praise and honor. And we... We ask you, Lord, to give us the encouragement, to give us the power, to give us um, the fearlessness that we need to step forward like the apostles did, even if it means persecution, that we might not see a majority perish. Lord, there's a lot of cares and concerns in this world. There's a lot of cares and concerns within our own lives, whether they be physical, whether they be spiritual, whether they be temporal. Lord, that we would be able to cast those cares upon you. And that we would be able to trust in you to be our Lord and our God. We praise you, Father, in your name.